to look at uh, something kind of along those lines here in a minute. I'm going to look at really a famous story, a story that we all know uh, from the Bible. Um, if I were to ask you, and once again, I'm not looking for everybody to chatter. It seems like uh, like in school, I ask one person one question, all of a sudden this person over here, they have their take on it, and they have their take, and all of a sudden everybody's telling stories that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. But if I were to ask you, what is the most famous Bible story, what, what story pops into your head? David and Goliath, that would be a common one. Esther, I, uh, Esther is, I mean, if you ask, uh, what I'm saying, if you ask somebody on the, if you were walking down the street, somebody who doesn't go to church, but they've heard Bible stories throughout their life, what would they tell you? David and Goliath, I don't know about Moses. All right, Daniel and the lion's den was what we were looking for. How many thought that? Okay, four of you, good. Um, the rapture, right. What about trans, or, uh, transubstantiation? What? Um, how many know what transubstantiation is? What is transubstantiation? No, that's Noah. What's transubstantiation? I said, who knows what transubstantiation? You raised your hand and said, the old dude with the ark. And I said, no, that's Noah. Transubstantiation is the Catholic belief that when you take of the body or take of the cracker and the, commu- or the, the juice, that, that it actually turns into Jesus' body and blood as you eat it, which is gross on many levels. Cannibalistic. All right. Shh. All right. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to read four verses and we're going to get started. The Bible says, Then these presidents, in verse 6 now, then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, with which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree." Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for this opportunity, Lord. I pray that our hearts would be open to you. You'd block out the distractions, Lord, be able to focus for the few minutes we have. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Here, obviously, once again, probably one of the most famous stories in the Bible, we find Daniel in the lion's den. And there's so many different applications of Daniel in the lion's den. But as I was reading this the other day, never noticed it before. Or I've noticed it before, but just not in this way. We come across this king, King Darius. King Darius would have been a Persian. Uh, we understand the Persians, uh, the, after the Babylonians, uh, then the Persians came through. Uh, they are the uh, handwriting on the wall with Belshazzar. Uh, the Bible says that then the Persians, or well, history says, but the Bible also, that the Persians came through. They defeated the, the Babylonians, and now Daniel is serving these men as well, and Darius being the first one, Darius the Mede. And uh, Daniel, as he was a high-ranking official with Nebuchadnezzar and Bel- or Belshazzar, same thing here with uh, King Darius. The Bible says that he was uh, put up. He was uh, one of, uh, I believe, three princes. and he, or There were three princes. There was Daniel, and then there was the king. So he was a high-ranking official. And the Bible says this is what I'm uh, going to talk about. But the Bible says that in verse 5, he said, uh, the uh, princes trying to get something against Daniel said, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. In other words, they knew the only way to get Daniel wasn't this temptation or that temptation. The only way we can get him is if, there's, if it's something to do with his God. And honestly, from a teenage standpoint, would to God, that would be us. The only thing that people could catch us on is something to do with God rather than this temptation or, or this enticement or this thing or that thing where we honestly, for the most part, that's where we fall. And it's not, or it, doesn't make the, it doesn't make the job very difficult for the devil. But we find this, uh, this man, Darius, then. These princes come to him and say, you know what, king? Why don't you make a law that for 30 days nobody can ask for anything? Nobody can pray to any god other than to you as the king. And you can imagine Darius' pride welling up within him. And uh, the Bible says that very, very quickly after the four verses I read, it says, wherefore, they, they explained to him, you know, this and this. And they were flattering him they were stroking his ego and he you know what that's a good idea and the bible says he signed it into law now the thing with the law of the Medes and Persians it mentions there is it could never be undone even the story with uh queen esther 
And you think of, uh, of how um, Haman had the law passed that he could kill, kill all the Hebrews. And Esther went to him and set, or finally all the, the banquet and all that. And they, it came back that it was Haman. The king couldn't just say, you know what, That's not gonna, that can't happen. The Bible says the king said basically, you know what, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to pass another law that says that the Hebrews can defend themselves. Because the, the law of the Medes and the Persians could not be changed. And so it gave them the opportunity then to defend themselves instead of just letting Haman uh, slaughter them. And that's what happens here. They came to him and said, you know what? Why don't you, you know what, king, you're such a great king and you conquered this, uh, this, uh, these Babylonians. You rule the entire world. Why shouldn't, why should people ask anything of anybody other than you? You are the pinnacle. And so he signed the decree. I say that, and you, we'll see, as you'll see as we get into this, the, the idea we don't see Darius put any thought or Darius put any prayer into the decision that he made. We find ourselves a lot of times in the same place. Obviously, I mentioned in chapel today that, you know, some of the seventh and eighth graders, the decisions you have to make aren't nearly as life altering as the juniors and seniors are. Juniors and seniors are looking at, you know, college to go to and from there a career and a spouse and so, well, some of them a spouse. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but they're looking at, at these potential things that are out there and how uh, impactful that is on their lives. But you seventh and eighth graders, the decisions you make now, they affect the life you live right now. And they are important decisions. And in turn, we see here this king thought, you know what, this is a good idea. And he made, made no thought made no prayer, nothing in regards to the decision. He just made the decision. And I want, to see, want you to see what happens. He makes the decision. We know the story. The Bible says that Daniel got up as a four time and he prayed or opened the uh, window or opened the shutters on his window and he began to pray. And they caught him and basically brought him before the king. Now, king, here's what you did. Remember, you made that law. Daniel disobeyed. It doesn't matter how much you love Daniel. He disobeyed and this is what he deserves. Look in verse 14, it says, when the king realized what he had done, he says, Then the, kings, when he heard, the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He was sore displeased with himself, and he spent a, a large amount of his important kingly day and time trying to undo a decision that had he just gone to God in the first place and prayed or even just thought about it, he wouldn't have made that decision. You see, far too often we find ourselves in a predicament and we find ourselves doing this and doing that. Why? Because we've chosen what we wanted to do rather than saying, God, what do you want me to do? In some cases we may ask, God, what do you want me to do? And think, you know what, I don't want to do that. And we choose to do something different. And in that case, well, in both cases, we've put ourselves in a bad spot and a lot of the difficulties and trials and problems that come about come about because of our refusal to go to God about what needs to be done. Be very careful about making decisions quickly. Be very careful about somebody who wants you to make decisions quickly. Uh, I've heard before, I don't necessarily have a Bible basis to prove this, but don't ever make decisions when you're tired. Okay? Don't ever make decisions when you're hungry. Okay? Right. <laughs> okay? But if, honestly, if you think about it, okay, how many, well, I'm not going to ask because then it turns into, oh, yeah, this one time, okay? If you go grocery shopping with your parents, okay, never go grocery shopping when you're hungry because you don't buy what you're supposed to buy. You buy something to snack on as you're walking through the store, and you buy this and you buy that, and by the time you actually get home to cook the meal that you got or the meal with the ingredients that you bought, you're full because of all the snacking that you did, and it's not good for you, and it's not good for your budget either. Don't make decisions when you're in a bad spot. Honestly, if I can say this, don't make major decisions if your walk with God is not what it's supposed to be because you're the one making the decision, and it's never going to be a good decision. It may seem good for a small amount of time, but eventually the, the things that God would have shown to you and said, look, you want to avoid this, and you want to avoid that, and don't do and don't do, we end up doing those things. Why? Because we didn't go to him in the first place and say, God, prov or provide a, uh, uh, a, a vision to, so I don't fall into these pits. So I avoid the pitfalls that come about. God's there to do that, but unfortunately we don't go see him. And here we see here this king, he was sort of displeased with himself. You can imagine, if I can put it in modern terminology then, where it's going to progress from there. And we'll see it. I'll, I'll use the verse here in a second. But he sort of displeased with himself. He spends all night fretting and worrying Later, you see, uh, it says he labored till the going down of the sun. Look in verse 14. For, uh, sorry, we already read verse 14. Look at uh, verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. He didn't eat. 
Neither were instruments of music brought before him. He was inconsolable and he was unable to sleep. Oh, Brother Morrissey, I just can't sleep. I was telling a, a teenager a little while back, they were talking about how they weren't able to sleep. And I told him, I said, look, it is not natural for someone not to be able to sleep. Now, obviously, certain things, you know, sometimes maybe you don't feel well, things like that. That's a different story. But it's not natural for you all of a sudden to just not be able to sleep. And a lot of times, honestly, you think of the story with Samuel and Eli. God came to Samuel and said, Samuel, Samuel. Why? He just wanted to talk to Samuel. He wanted that, to develop that relationship with Samuel. And it may be God coming to you, waking you up, or not letting you go to sleep, saying, hey, why don't you spend time with me? Why don't you spend time with me? Rather than laying there and counting sheep or trying to make yourself fall asleep or just laying there with your eyes closed you fall asleep, try praying. Try getting up and read your Bible for a little while and you'd be amazed. All of a sudden, that was all it took. And you go right back, or you go to sleep, or right back to sleep. And unfortunately, here, he had left God out of his decision. He made the decision on his own. Now, we understand this is a heathen king, though we could make the argument for, well, especially for Cyrus, the next king, but we could make the argument for Darius as well with the relationship that he and David had, or David, he and uh, Daniel had, that he could have possibly, possibly been saved. We don't know that. But so we're, we are looking at a heathen king here, but if we apply it to our own lives, as we have major decisions coming about, allow God to make the decisions. I'm not saying allow God to be part of your decision. Allow God to make the decision. Well, how will I know? God gives you principles in his word. You see, what happens is we get in our mind, here's what I want. God, bless it. It doesn't work that way. And here we see, well, you know what? This is a good idea. And then as soon as he had signed it, and Daniel was caught, he knew, oh, man, that was a foolish mistake. And I don't want to see you guys caught in that same spot. You're going to have major decisions that come about in your lives. Some now, some down the road, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. If you can learn now as a 7th grader through a 12th grader to say, you know what, when it's, a dis- when it's decision time, I'd rather go to God too much than not enough. I used to think, you know what, well, I'm not going to ask God, you know, what to wear this or today or, or this or that. Those are just foolish everyday things. But I would rather ask God about those things so I get in the habit of asking what God's opinion or what God's provision is on those different things than to make decisions on my own. We're fallible. We're human beings. Are we going to make the right decisions sometimes? Absolutely. Are we going to make them right all the time? No. God, God won't make a mistake. So then why does this, why did this go wrong? Why did this go wrong? It's probably because we, put, we either blocked God's voice out or we heard God's voice and decided we wanted to do what we, want, what we wanted to do anyway. And as a result, that puts us in a very bad spot. And then this comes up and that comes up in problems we never even thought would come about. Why? Because we chose to do what we wanted to do. And here this king, we see these different results of his choice to do what he wanted to do. Another example from the Bible in Genesis chapter 25 who do we find in Genesis chapter 25 along these same lines? Good. I'm glad to see everybody's with me. Who? You're on the right track. Jacob and Esau. Esau, the Bible says, comes back from, the, uh, from um, hunting. And uh, he comes inside and he's starving. And we find Jacob in the kitchen. Nothing goes right when the man's in the kitchen. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a little side note. That's a different sermon for a different time. Okay. Had... I'll stop there because I get off track, okay? But there's so many things running through my head right now. I just can't. I'm not allowed to use them because uh, my wife's looking at me in a very angry way. No. Um, But anyway, in Genesis chapter 25, we find Esau. The Bible said Esau goes out hunting and he comes back. And the Bible says that he's hungry. Now, the Bible says we've all been there, or or especially Aiden. When they go through their growth spurts, uh, they inhale food. Like, I'm I'm pretty sure it doesn't even hit their teeth. Like, it just goes in, straight swallowed, gone. But they're, mom, I'm starving to death. No, you're not. Okay. Say, or honestly, Sadie's probably the worst. She only does it, though, if she sees a chip bag. Uh, mom, I'm so hungry. It's just because you see a bag of Doritos. Go sit down. You'll be fine. Um, and then she goes and gets Doritos anyway and has Doritos. I told him this morning about uh, Disney Plus, about watching basketball. And Sadie come in, just changing the channel to a uh, Disney Princess movie. And so we watched the Disney Princess movie. We didn't go back to basketball. Um, but um, we find here Esau, the Bible says Esau comes in. Esau, quote, unquote, starving to death. He's hungry. And he goes to Jacob and says, Jacob, uh, or he sees Jacob. The Bible says that Jacob's making uh, a pottage or like a stew type 
type thing. And uh, he comes in, and, oh, I'm starving, I'm starving. And the whole uh, trans- or the uh, uh, interaction that goes on, he gives away his birthright, the Bible, for, the Bible says, for some food. And as a result, you think, oh, just stop and think, or just walk past Jacob and go in the house and get some more food. But he made an instantaneous decision based on something that he desired, and as a result, gave away his birthright. He didn't think about it. An interesting thing, though, as I was studying this, Look, if you, oh, you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 25, 30, this is what the Bible says. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee. I, I added the accent in because I don't know it necessarily said it that way, but uh, <laughs> feed me, I pray thee. Now listen, listen what he says here. With that same red pottage, a red stew, for I am faint. Therefore, whenever we see the word therefore, we look to see what it's there for. Why is it there? Therefore was his name called Edom. Now, what's that mean? Edom means red. Esau and his descendants were forever labeled by his lack of taking time to think and process a decision that he made. Edom. The Edomites would terrorize the Israelites for years. When Moses and the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness multiple times, who attacks them? The Edomites. The people that were labeled by their great, 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 whatever grandfathers, lack of ability to pray or think through a decision that he made. Nobody in here would I say, you are stupid. Now, do you act stupid sometimes? Absolutely. Okay. Case in point. Thank you. Um, but let's, uh, yeah, we'll save testimonies till the end. Um, but, but anyway, um, but we look a lot more foolish when we choose our own way. The Bible says that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end, of the way, the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, we think, you know what, this looks good and this, but that, that looks fantastic. But we have no idea what that can lead to. That's why it's so important that when a decision comes about or somebody asks us different things, take some time, think about it, pray about it. Well, no, no, you don't have time for it. Then I don't need it. Well, but, but I might miss an opportunity. You don't need it. If the pressure is on for a time, it's not that big of a deal. They may try to make it an emergency, but we see from the Bible multiple times where we make rapid deci- or people made rapid decisions or unthought out decisions or unprayed through decisions, and as a result, how it turned out. We see Esau, and we saw um, uh, Dan or the, the story with Darius as well. Both times, both men made quick decisions, and as a result, it put them in a bad spot. Honestly, if I could use a verse to go along with it, in Proverbs 3, 6, the Bible says, um, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Acknowledge Christ. What? God, what do you want from me? This is what I want, and this is the dream that I have, and this is what I think would be best. But what do you want? Now, here's the thing. God's not going to all of a sudden open heaven and start speaking to you. But I prayed about it. That's good. You talk to God about it. God's going to talk to you through his word. You can't say, well, you know what? This is what I think God wants. If you're not walking with God the way you're supposed to. When people, when you say that, what you're telling me is, you know what? This is what I want to do, and I'm hoping God's going to bless it. If not, uh, I, hope it, I hope it works out in the end. It doesn't happen that way. Multiple people have made bad decisions, bad decisions, bad decisions that at first look like a good decision. Um, you know why a trap works? If you went out into the wilderness to trap something, why does a trap work? Why does a mouse trap work? When we were uh, in our shed at our house, um, we had a serious rat problem. And it wasn't many rats. It was just, I think there was a family, small family, mommy rat, or da- daddy rat, mommy rat, little baby rats. Um, but we had a rat problem. They were in the, the rafters. There were, uh, the people before us had plywood and stuff up there they were storing. And I think they were, or they were living up there. And so I got up there one day and I was just pulling things down, pulling things down. And uh, one, we, or one, as I pulled the board this way, it went running up in the rafter, rafters. And it was, it was a significant rat. Uh, and it, got, it went out and whatever. So I put a trap in there. Put a trap. And obviously you put a trap in there. You think, put, put some peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter. How many like crunchy peanut butter? How many like creamy peanut butter? How many would rather have crunchy than, I'd rather have creamy than crunchy. Ugh. I'm not a peanut person. Um, anyway, uh, got off track. Um, oh, what? 
Crunchy peanut butter or creamy peanut butter? It's the fact that I'm not a huge fan of peanut butter. It's crunchy or creamy? I'm talking about the crunchiness of the peanut. I don't like peanuts, almonds. Now, I do like, um, what are the things you guys sell? The praline pecans. No, pecans. There's no such thing as a pecan. Technically, a pecan Technically, a pecan would be a chamber pot, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, anyway, back to what we're saying. So, listen, shh, shh. So I put the trap up there, and I put the peanut butter. I took that big glob of peanut butter, and I put it on there, and then I went out there every day. Nothing, 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 nothing. And I forgot about it. One day, my, I, it was, this was back during the summer. One day, my wife, uh, I think the, the kids were getting ready to go swimming, and we store the swimming stuff in the shed. And my wife went over there, opened the door, and then closed the door and came back. She said, something is dead in there. And I went, my trap! And so I went running out, got my ladder, climbed up in there, and lo and behold, pulled it down. And I had, uh, the body was about that long. Big old teeth on that thing. Now listen, listen. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Shh. Here's how a trap works. Listen. A trap works because you get so focused on what you think is positive and you don't know that trap is getting ready to snap and kill you. That's how a trap works. Their story goes, and I think my dad made this up as a kid, but I'm going to use it like it's truth. Is pastor done? Oh, good heavens. That was really quick. I'm going to tell my last story, and then we'll go. The story goes that down in Brazil, uh, one of the delicacies in Brazil is monkey brain. Okay, where, shh, okay, monkey brain. And the way the farmer does it, the farmer doesn't hunt, shh, doesn't hunt the monkey. He traps the monkeys. And what, what ended up happening, if you think, my dad always did this. We were kids. I can't believe my dad's so horrible to do this. But uh, as kids, he named, the monkey's name was Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi, <laughs> Chi-Chi, the little monkey, shh, shh. Okay, Chi-Chi, the little monkey, listen, going throughout. Okay, anyway, Chi-Chi. Huh? Okay, I, I, whatever, I'm going to tell the story. Okay, so anyway, shh, stay with me, okay? Keep your focus, okay? I know you might have little giggly stories in your head, but keep your focus on what I'm saying because there's a point I'm making with it. So anyway, so Chi-Chi, this little monkey, as he's uh, gallivanting along through the forest or whatever, the, what the uh, hunter would do is he'd put a jar on the ground and put something shiny in the bottle, bottom. The j- top of the jar was very, very small, though, and what would happen is that little monkey would come by, and that monkey would reach in there for that shiny object, and he'd grab a hold of that object, and he'd try to pull his hand out, but he couldn't do it. And that, that little jar, w- that jar was stuck there, and he couldn't pull it out, and he couldn't pull it out, but he would not let go of what was inside And so then the hunter would come along like a trapper would. He'd see that monkey. He'd come over, bash the monkey over the head, kill the monkey and take it and harvest the brains. Now I say that to say this. Listen, listen. Some of you take a hold of things. Listen. Some of you take a hold of sins and things and you refuse to let them go. Well, it's not that bad. I can have it. I can play with it. And look, you can't. The devil's waiting to come along like Jesus told Peter. He's waiting to come along and sift you like wheat. He's coming along to destroy you. And some of you sit there and you play with it. And you play with it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. And it is a big deal. It's not a big deal. And then your head gets bashed in. And in a youth group like this, we look back and think, hey, you remember so-and-so? Yeah, whatever happened to them? I don't know. Why? Because you made the decision back here. And at that point, you have nobody to blame but yourself. That monkey, I don't know if, there were, if the monkeys would chatter and talk. I don't know if monkeys chatter when, or talk when they chatter or what. But telling, no, don't go near that. No, don't go near that. Don't go near that. But Chi-Chi was going to be different. I know that monkey died and that monkey died and that monkey died. But look, I'm different. It's not going to happen that way to me. And guess what? It happened the exact same way it happened to every other monkey. You're no different. The world wants to chew you up. The world wants to spit you out. Stop putting yourself in the position where that can happen. We see here with these, with, uh, with Esau and uh, Darius, both of them. You know what? I'm going to make the decision that I want. I know I didn't pray about it. I didn't ask God about it. But this is what I think is best. And both of them, Esau lost his birthright. Darius spent a sleepless night ate no food, beat himself up when he would have, if he had just gone to God and said, God, what should I do? Or even just sat down and thought the possibilities, God would have said, you know what? That's not the right way to go. And as a result, Darius has a much better night. Allow God to make your decisions. Don't make him part of your decisions. 
allow him to make your decisions. That starts by you opening this. In your own heart, you know the last time you opened this. I'm not going to sit here and say, when's the last time and go around the room. As I said this morning in chapel, it would be interesting, that Instagram filter that went on the head with the, the Disney thing. And you, which Disney character you most like? And <laughs> what if there was one that uh, when you put it on your head, it showed how long you spent with God that day? And that thing would spin, what would it come up? A zero? Now, once again, we don't, do, we don't walk with God to say, ha, ha, I spent this time with God. We walk with God so God can feed us. When's the last time you spent time with him? When's the last time you went to him for a major decision? Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done.